Jack. Uh, he is a professor of uh, uh, physics uh, at Berkeley here, and he has done a lot of work in uh, cosmology and also Bayesian statistical method. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, you asked to give a talk, slice the normalizing flow, optimization, and something. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, and I will actually be talking about geometries a lot, actually, I think. So but we'll see what the connection is. It will be interesting. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm, my talk is in two parts. First, I will talk about uh, normalizing flows, and in particular, a specific normalizing flow, which is based on optimal transport, slight optimal transport. Um, I thought I would cover that because you know part of this uh, workshop and, and this program is about optimal transport and so but then the more important next part is how we can use normalizing flows to improve the geometries of the sampling and to actually do sampling okay so that's that's uh, the plan of the talk so what are normalizing flows normalizing flows are maps from some simple let's call it latent space uh, where distribution is simple uh, and I will be always using um, uh, uncorrelated Gaussian with zero mean and unit variance, a simple uh, base distribution. And then through the maps, through this nonlinear functions, let's call them F, uh, which each of which uh, is supposed to be simple, but then you know, a collection of them together can create something very complicated, like, like a distribution that looks like this. So these maps are bijective. So we, and, uh, we want to be able to both invert these uh, individual uh, maps. So they need to be simple to invert. And perhaps even more importantly, we want to be able to compute the Jacobian of the transformation so that we are able to compute the density of the uh, of whatever we want to estimate. Okay, so the basic uh, two applications of normalizing flows are first, we can sample from the latent space and create samples which look realistic. And the second goal, uh, which as I said, is more important for, the, for this uh, discussion here is that we can estimate the density of the, let's say some data uh, with this uh, you know, framework. Okay, so one the example, uh, just to you know, uh, get started, suppose, suppose we train on the, on the entropy, suppose we train on the, on the mean log P, uh, you have some training data, uh, X, uh, so X will always be data here. Uh, and um, so how do we train this thing? Uh, we, for example, we try to maximize the entropy. Um, uh, you know, maybe we start with something simple. Uh, this is the data distribution. This is in latent space, doesn't look very good, but after the end of training, you know, maybe we have created a function that looks like this, uh, and we have managed to map this uh, distribution to a Gaussian. Okay, and so then once we do this, as I said, we can both sample and we can uh, evaluate the density in the, of the data, in the data space P of X. Okay, so in one day, it's, it's easy. Uh, of course, the situation gets much more complicated uh, in high dimensions. Um, and again, the most important aspect of noise flows is that we are that we parameterize this this uh, as a maybe flow, but where we can do the um, both the inverse and the Jacobian uh, easily, so that we can actually quickly evaluate them. There's a lot of normalizing flows in the literature. Some are actually continuous based on ODs, even PDs. So there are nice, con nice connections there. But uh, the one I'll be talking about is uh, sliced iterative normalizing flow because I said it's based on optimal transport and it's a paper that has been accepted by the CML. Um, so um, the motivation is random transform. Um, uh, so why slices? Uh, the motivation is random transform. Um, random transform says that any probability distribution, high dimensional probability distribution can be described as, uh, as an integral over one dimensional slices, okay? So that means this is a statement that you can, you know, this is a universal approximator. These slices can be a universal approximator. You can approximate any probability distribution with just slices. Uh, CAT scans are a great example of this. Uh, what they do in the brain, right? You, you, uh, you project um, the, the map, whatever it is, uh, in different directions. Uh, you do these slices in different directions. Uh, this is the input so-called scenogram. Uh, then what you do is you Fourier transform. You have to then apply it with this um, um, kernel, uh, which is k-dependent, uh, and then you uh, you know uh, align these uh, Fourier transforms um, on a circle, um, and then you inverse Fourier transform, and you get an image of a brain. So, uh, what is the issue in general uh, when we scale this to high dimensions? So, this is a two-dimensional example, and we had you can see we had a lot of slices. As we go to high and high dimensions, we get, of course, the curse of dimensionality. Uh, it is, uh, you know, impossible to do 
uh, all possible slice directions and, and average over them. Okay, so then what is the next best thing that one can do is uh, to actually look for directions of the largest distance between the slices. So here um, is where uh, I guess optimal transport and Wasserstein distances come in. Um, so let's first, um, we can write uh, in the random transform, we can write um, um, sliced, sliced P Wasserstein distance, which is the, basically the distance between two, two distributions in terms of these slices, right? So the motivation is the random transform and we can write this um, as basically one dimensional distances, but then integrated over all possible, uh, you know, the sphere in this d-dimensional uh, volume. So this is obviously still very expensive. You know, we haven't solved anything. Uh, now, instead of that, what we can do is we can look for the, for the directions of the maximum uh, Wasserstein distance, uh, maximum slice Wasserstein distance. Um, and so that's basically, we're looking just for the slices with the largest distance and we can look for one of them. But what is much more efficient is if we look for K of them at once, where, where K could be the dimension of the system or maybe something lower. And then these, would, these are then orthogonal to each other, uh, these directions. And that means we can look, search for these directions uh, of large uh, deviations between two distributions. Uh, we can look, uh, look, look for them all at once. All right, so th this is basically how our method works. Um, imagine you're trying to map one distribution to another. Let's say you're trying to map uh, blue to, to orange. Orange is our target. Blue is uh, this one. Um, so how do we do this? Um, we first do an optimization problem where we're looking for directions which maximize the, dis the, the distance, the Wasserstein distance on this slice. Uh, so this is an optimization, optimization pro problem where we're looking for direction. So for example, uh, in this case, for example, we found in this direction, there's a very large uh, you know, Wasserstein distance between these two distributions. Okay, so then in the next step, we apply this normalizing flow idea and we map along the slice, the two distributions. All right, so along this particular slice, the two distributions now are equal. Uh, so we use basic uh, splines to, to do this mapping. Um, and then of course, in the high dimensional space, we have not achieved a perfect um, matching of the two distributions, but we have come closer, right? So in, in, now in two dimensional space, you know, now blue looks like this uh, and it's much closer to the orange than it was before. So what do we do next? Well, we keep doing this, right? So that's uh, how we try to avoid the curse of dimensionality uh, by, uh, by this procedure. And this is an iterative procedure. So it's a greedy algorithm, in, in, at least in the way I phrase it here. Okay, so this is the algorithm. I'm not gonna go through the details, but let me just uh, you know, point out, this is a neural network structure in the sense that these directions are linear operations. They're just orthonormal matrices. Um, so these are these weights, if you want, and then there are nonlinearities, which are these one one point distribution function maps, um, based on this, uh, you know, um, mapping between these two distributions, and these are much more general than your your standard machine learning uh, relus or whatever, right? These are basically very very powerful one dimensional functions, really. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Um, does it work? It works actually very well, even in high dimensions. Um, here are some examples of uh, sampling uh, from this after we have trained on fashion MNIST, for example. Uh, you can see how after one iteration, you get this, after 10 iterations, you get this, and then you know, after a few hundred, you get you know, pretty good uh, fashion clothes. Um, here are celebrity images, for example. And here are just uh, various samples from our trainings uh, on MNIST, fashion MNIST, the CIFAR, and, and celebrity. Uh, so these are high dimensional examples, right? The uh, MNIST is 784, uh, these, these guys are more like 3000. So this is, is clearly can work as, a, you know, as, a, as approximately very high dimensional probability distributions in terms of sampling. Now, what is I think far more important for the purpose of this um, uh, discussion is how well we, are we doing on the density estimation? And on the density estimation, there are these data sets um, from UCI yeah, yeah. Uh, the, so what, in the previous slide, when you do the sampling, okay, so you you had two. So as far as I can tell, you're trying to match two distributions. What are you trying to match? It's like the sample distribution, one coordinate at a time. Is that what you were doing? So we, if you were to go, so here's my question: If I were to go to the number of iterations there, to 2,500, which is the dimension, does this mean that I'm going to actually be? This is not a dimension. This is just a number of iterations. Sure. Yeah. So let's say I take this number of iterations to the full dimension of the image space. 
Yeah, it's always full dimension. Each each one is an, at a full dimension. Each one. No, I'm saying I take the the number of iterations to be the dimension of the image space. Right? Yeah. Okay. So let's say I do this. All right. So that means that I've actually matched all the directions for this Wasserstein no, thing. No, 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 no. Why not? You're, no, I mean, you're... Look, I mean look, think of random transformation, right? We, it was two dimensional. It doesn't mean that two directions are good enough, right? No, you need, you know, in principle, you need all possible directions, right? I see. Okay. And, yeah. But if I take all possible directions, does this mean that this flow is going to push to the sample distribution of my images or, or is it going to create new images? That's what I'm... Sorry, sorry, what? So, oh, it's pushing to the Gaussian. Is that what it's doing? Uh, well, in this case, we're pushing actually a Gaussian to the data, right? In this case, the, the flow can be done in both directions. Uh -huh. Right, you can either map uh, match the Gaussian and make it a, to a flow to match the probability distribution of data, or you can do the other way around. In fact, this is why we, we have two things which are called SIG. This one is from the Gaussian to the data, and this one here is actually from the data to the Gaussian. Okay, uh, and they are slightly different actually. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Understand one step. Once you have done once after you have done one step and you have the push forward of your initial distribution by this, you know, one dimensional basically map. It, it can be k, k dimensional, right? Because you can. Yeah, have that's what I was asking. K, so k, k dimensions. So one iteration involves these k dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, now let's look at the density estimation. Um, um, so that is uh, UCI data sets, uh, which come in hundred thousands of them. And they're very horrible looking actually. And they, you know, in this case, they are, you know, six dimension to 63 dimensions. They were pretty horrible looking actually. Uh, so um, this method is not really state of the art necessarily um, on the full data set. So uh, I need to tell you, I have two versions of our method here. One is with low regularization, which is very fast. And one with, uh, with high regularization, which is slightly slower. So um, they do pretty well. Um, um, but maybe they're not quite state of the art at the, at the, at the maximum data size, but at the low data size, uh, so now it's hundred to a thousand, it's always the best. Our method is always the best, okay? Um, so that means it has some very good inductive bias properties um, that is going to be suitable if you want to approximate probability distributions in the low number of sample uh, settings, which is what we really care about uh, when we talk about sampling and MCMC, yes? Uh, well, yes, so regularization in this context is that uh, there is a regularization pa uh, parameter, um, well, uh, which uh, prefers not to do any mapping. So in other words, if, um, so this is to prevent overfitting, basically. If you have, uh, if you were just letting this algorithm on its own, then it will perhaps overfit, even if you're doing just slices. But the regularization parameter says, okay, let me, let me, let, 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 let's my, my priority to be, I do nothing. And so then it actually does less than it should have. Um, but by doing less than it should have, then on many, many different iterations of this, it actually does better. So can you comment more on the inductive bias? Do you mean some kind of implicit bias? Sorry? Uh, can you inductive comment? bias? Yeah, yeah. there's some like implicit bias. Implicit bias, yes, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah, here I'm comparing to different um, normalizing flows that are out there. There's these things called MAF, uh, mass auto regressive flow. There is... Um, uh, neural spline flow. These are state of the art. Fjord is all state of the art, right? Uh, the other thing I actually wanted to mention is KDE is a very poor density estimator, especially in high dimensions, kernel density estimation, right? Even, even if you adjust the kernel uh, to the best possible value, it's, you know, KDE, I forget which one is that thing. This one here, uh, KDE is what? Orange, yeah. You see, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, for example, look at this six dimensional space. It's not even that high dimensional. It's, it's really poor uh, for low number samples. This is all on the, on the whole. Like, this is all cross validation. Yeah. So you're you're just measuring the likelihood of your points yeah. on this yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is all on cross validation. Yeah. This is not the training data. Okay. So the other thing that I think is very good about this method is that it's actually very fast. Uh, especially on this low organization, which you can see actually it's not that bad, really, right? Um, uh, we get seconds. We're talking about seconds uh, for evaluating uh, this code through, and other normalizing flows can be a lot, a lot slower. All right, so that's those are the two things that are nice. Or oh, the third one that is very nice is we actually think we think we have a lot fewer hyperparameters than other other codes. Okay, as as you know, we all know hyperparameters are is the black magic of machine learning. But this this code actually has very few of them. All right, so let me now move on. Oh yeah, so one application is uh, anomaly detection. Uh, and so here, for example, we have done 
uh, there was there was this challenge in in LHC in physics, uh, which is not actually my field, is because I'm a, I'm a cosmologist. But anyway, we we played this game with them, uh, and we did a density estimation as a um, there was a challenge. They injected some events. This uh, and there was a challenge basically try to find the, the, this particle right as this resonance and so this actually is our result this is actually from the CERN courier it turns out that we we we, we were by far the best on this task even though these people are actually pretty sophisticated they, they, they really do a lot of machine learning uh, in that community but then, nevertheless these, these density estimators are very good for anomaly detection okay but all right let's move on now to what we really care about here at this workshop which is how can we use normalizing flows for sampling. Um, all right, just to remind you, uh, the task that we uh, want, at least that I want, but I presume also a lot of uh, people here, is that we want to get, this is the Bayesian context, right? We want to get the Bayesian posteriors, given some data. So now I'm going to talk about parameters. Let's call them Y, and X will continue to be the data. OK, so we want a, a posterior P of Y given X. Um, but all we know is access to, to this joint P of X and Y, which is the likelihood times the prior. And, um, and so um, we all know uh, MCMCs are the method of choice and we all know that many different flavors, depending on whether you have the score or gradient or not and things like that. We also all know that there are many issues with that. The, the chains are correlated. Um, the burn, you know, the main net have converged, the burning problem and things like that. Um, so uh, I wanna emphasize two things for my own applications. Um, two things are very often we have very expensive uh, likelihoods. Uh, be that's because to predict uh, like, I don't know, some, some result from some experiment, you may need to run a whole simulation or, or an OD or a PD solver or something like that, right? So this, this solvers to get the prediction and therefore to get the likelihood can be very, very expensive, all right? So I'm interested in this regime where the likelihood deviation is, is very expensive and probably dominates the cost. Second thing is, uh, for better or worse, uh, a lot of these um, uh, applications, you know, they do not, they, these, these solvers, let's say PD, PD OD, um, a simulation, whatever, they do not have gradient, all right, or with respect to these parameters, why? Uh, these, you know, people are just not used to uh, writing solvers and have a gradient, right? So we are, in machine learning, of course, people are used to have you know bad propagation, so they have greater respect all the parameters. But when it comes to some scientific applications, that's not the case. All right, so I will also be talking a lot about gradient-free uh, uh, applications, which you know maybe it's not the applications you guys have in mind because you know as we know uh, Hamilton, both Hamilton and Langevin dynamics require gradients. Uh, okay, so so what's the plan here? The plan is let's surrogate the posterior. Um, with a normalizing flow. Now, um, as I said, what we have access is a joint, uh, but we have no idea where, a priori at least, where in the parameter space it peaks and where it's zero. And of course, we also do not know the normalization constant or partition function, uh, let's call it Z. Um, and so, therefore, we do not know really the, the, the posterior, we just, but we are able to evaluate something proportional to the density uh, at, at, a, at a given sample. So previously, we, this is a much harder task than what I was talking about before, right? Previously, we had samples from P of X and we fitted density. Now this is a harder problem. So basic idea that I will be talking about is uh, what I call an annealing flow uh, in the sense of the temperature annealing. Um, but I will also then talk about, uh, and that's because uh, I'm thinking a lot about these applications without a gradient. But then I will actually later also show other possible flows, uh, which are possible if you have gradients. Okay, so, and finally, our goal uh, at least is uh, to get away with as few calls of the likelihood as possible, because that's the really expensive thing for us. And so this is, I think, where the, the fact that SIMF does so well uh, with small number of densities is, is particularly useful. All right, so annealing flow is a different type of flow than uh, what you have been talking about, but it's still a flow, and so let me actually write it in, in the language of the flows. Uh, so let's forget that, uh, let's first talk about the, the temperature dependent target density. So this is where you take the likelihood to, to the some power beta times the prior. And so at beta is zero, uh, so at high temperature, uh, this is just the prior, and then at beta is one, then this is the target density that we wanna get. So let's also then define a dissimilarity fun uh, function 
between the target and the current estimate of the of Q. All right. Now this dissimilarity, as I said, can uh, can be, for example, one that I like a lot. If I don't have gradients, is I'm just going to do log of P minus log of Q minus log of Z, because I don't know the normalization function. I have to have it in here, and then I'm squaring this. Okay. But you could also do KL divergence. Um, uh, but um, but KL divergence actually will not work if you don't have gradients. At least it will not work very well. Uh, if you have gradients, then one, uh, again, that I like a lot is a Fisher divergence. So we take a gradient of P and minus gradient of Q and you square it and then you just average overall gradients. All right, so these are the dissimilarity measures. Um, now the kneeling flow, uh, I am writing here as a flow in the density, uh, in the probability density, uh, and it's flowing with beta with temperature from zero to one. And it's given by some, uh, let's call it hyperparameter lambda. And then we have a gradient of this dissimilarity times the gradient of, of, the, uh, of the target objective Q, right? And both these grains are with respect to parameters of the normalizing flow. So think of this normalizing flow having a bunch of three parameters. These would be these rotation matrices. This would be these spline parameters that I mentioned earlier, right? These, these are all a bunch of parameters. We need to, we want to train them. We want to see how these parameters are flowing as we change the temperature from zero to one. Okay, so this is now, you see, this equation uh, looks sort of similar to, to Wasserstein uh, flow, but it doesn't enforce explicit normalization. Why not? Well, because these normalizing flows are normalized. That's the point of this normalizing, right? They're already normalized. I don't need to worry about normalization because it's already built in, into this, into the, it's already built into the, into the constraint of the system. Okay, so let's unpack this. Uh, all right, so what I'm doing here, I'm literally just, just uh, you know, doing this total derivative is a, uh, basically the derivative respect to each parameter times the derivative of each parameter. And so in terms of what I'm actually solving here, uh, I'm solving for these individual parameters phi, and uh, I'm saying the derivative of phi is just a gradient of L. So this is just the standard gradient descent, right? Uh, but the point here is that I keep changing the target of this gradient descent, right? So I keep doing this gradient descent, but the target itself is changing because I'm flowing in the temperature from zero to one. Yes. So, so due to this, it seems like there could be a variety of, for a variety of ways of interpolating from what you get at beta equals zero, p of y, and your target b of one. Why do you choose this method of interpolating between the two? You mean y annealing, temperature annealing? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, and I will get to, back to that. Uh, when we have gradients, then you're absolutely right, and I will show some, some examples, right? But when you don't have gradients, actually, then it's, it, I, I think it is, uh, kneeling is one of the, you know, very powerful and, 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 and good ways to do this. Okay. So, uh, oh, by the way, so can I have a question? Yes. So what's the actual parameter lambda in the annealing flow? Um, right. So uh, let's see. I have it on the next slide, but um, yeah, let me do it on the next slide where I sh uh, show, uh, talk about the algorithm. But basically this lambda is, is giving you the learning rate. Um, okay. So let's talk about the algorithm. So we started beta by drawing samples from the prior. Now I can, uh, now I need to discretize, of course, this flow, right? And the way I will discretize it, I'll choose the next beta. I will have an adaptive uh, uh, criterion. Uh, and in fact, I will do it so that at the next beta, uh, the effective sample size, uh, which is uh, determined by these importance weights of the new beta, of this, uh, you know, true uh, joint, on the new beta divided by uh, old beta is a, a 0.5 or the total no, uh, number of samples. Okay, so if I draw 200 samples, then I want this beta not to change too much so that my effective sample size at the new beta level is still 100. Now I apply these importance weights to these, each of these samples, and now I resample them. Okay, so what this resampling does is it gets rid of the low, low density. Uh, uh, samples which are useless and so you know it kind of gets rid of them but in an unbiased way right uh, and so th this is uh, nothing new this is similar to how sequential monte carlo does uh, does its job but now the the new thing comes in is that now i fit uh, um, normalizing flow to the new density okay um on the current samples on the samples that i have and uh, and i do this uh, by using this synth code or maybe i do this with using this stochastic gradient descent uh, steps on this dissimilarity function, okay? In fact, we do both. So this is where optimization comes in, right? So this, you know, I'm solving first optimization problem to get a new, uh, a new um, normalizing flow that approximates uh, this P at the new beta. 
And now I need to do Metropolis Hastings adjustment as we always need to do in, in Langevin and Hamiltonian mechanics. We also need to do it here. And so the way I do this is that now I draw new samples from this new probability distribution. Uh, and uh, so this is where sampling comes in. Um, I evaluate the, 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 this, this value on the new samples, and then I compare each new sample to the old sample, and I use the standard Metropolis Hastings acceptance, right? So uh, if, if I have gone up in terms of the value of P divided by the transition rate, because this is really the transition, this Q now. Uh, if I go up, I'll accept it, and if I go down, I accept it with some probability. Uh, and so um, I do this several times if I have to, so that I reach 50% acceptance. Okay, and then I repeat to the new beta until I reach beta equal to one. So there are a couple of uh, ways to view this. Uh, one is a Marco process view um, that I just described. Um, but um, as we know, Marco process is, uh, has to have this transition rate. Uh, and it's you know, supposed to be, transition rate supposed to depend on, on, the, on the previous sample and the new sample. What uh, the main, the two main issues are, as we said, the samples can be correlated and the acceptance rate can be low. Now, what happens uh, with the, if I, if I take this algorithm that I described and I put it into this view? First of all, uh, the proposal is independent of uh, the proposal decision from y prime to, uh, from y to y prime is independent of y because I'm just sampling from the pre distribution. So these samples are completely uncorrelated. So in other words, I have perfect mixing. If I, if I have accepted this sample, it has, it has nothing to do with, with, with what I was comparing it. It's perfect mixing, okay? So that's one advantage. Second one, what, you know, if you look at this transition ray, what happens if, P, uh, if Q is actually proportional to P at that beta? Then we have R is equal to one. Then we accept all of the samples, okay? So we also have perfect acceptance. So those are the two main advantages of this strategy. Um, of course, in practice, we will not get Q to be exactly the same as the target, but we may get very close. And uh, you know, we strive to get to roughly 50% acceptance before we move on to the next uh, level. Okay, so this is the view of, um, of the uh, Marco chains, but there is another view um, where you can, we can think of these normalizing flows as preconditioners, but they're very, very powerful preconditioners. So not only they can handle high condition numbers, they can handle high condition numbers changing across the parameter space. Okay, because they have, they can, they can handle any geometry you throw at them. So um, what is nice is that we can actually do and uh, an look at basically just in the latent space what this probability distribution should be. And it's nothing else but the probability distribution in the original space uh, times the Jacobian or the inverse Jacobian, depending how you look at it. So, um, and so this is nice because we just have a new, new, uh, new target in latent space, we can sample now we know in latent space, the geometry is nice and simple. You know, it's a Gaussian, uncorrelated Gaussian. So, you know, all of the condition numbers have gone away, right? So this is nice if, if, if your target, if you have a good Q, uh, all of this goes away. And all you need to do is therefore now sampling in, 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 in with this new uh, target density. And, you know, not surprisingly, right? If you write this target density acceptance rate uh, in, um, the, the Hamiltonian Hastings acceptance rate in this the latent space, it will be just this, the ratio of these target densities. And not surprisingly, this is the same as the one I wrote on the previous slide, right? In, in, uh, in the Markov, um, okay, but so we can, we now have two options to, to do the sampling. One is the one I was talking about uh, before, but the other one is I can just do the, my standard uh, Metropolis casing sampling, where I just look uh, around an existing sample I draw, you know, a Gaussian sphere, I draw a sample and, you know, blah, 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 right? So, so we have several ways of sample. And of course, we can also do Hamiltonian or Langevin dynamics in this latent space. So this would be uh, the, this Riemannian geometry view, right? Where um, I, have, I can now do sampling, um, Hamiltonian or, or Langevin sampling. And what is uh, interesting is um, I can rewrite these equations that I wrote in a language where it becomes this Riemannian uh, language of this paper, uh, Girolami and Colorhead, right? Where they proposed basically a, a position dependent mass matrix uh, G, and they proposed to, to use this information to do the sampling. Now, unfortunately, that, that, that method that they proposed is not working very well because actually you need to take a gradient of this metric uh, of, you know, of the curvature. And so it becomes a big mess, and actually nobody's using that. But uh, in the latent space, you can still do this, and it's actually 
you know, you can think of this uh, sampling that I'm proposing here as um, as a way of uh, doing what they have proposed, but in latent space where it's much more efficient. This actually uh, uh, has been done in Hoffman et al. And so, for example, here they show, um, for, for example, in original space, you know, these are the samples here, there's 200 steps, very short steps. Uh, in, the, in the latent space, you can see how the initial steps can be very long. And that's because of this Jacobian is Jacobian is saying, okay, you know, you can just take long steps. Um, and so the, the sampling becomes much more efficient. Okay, so does it work? Um, I don't know that this is work in progress, um, but I am optimistic. Um, here's an example that we just recently obtained. This is 10 dimensional correlate Gaussian. These are, you know, okay, not, not extremely high condition number, but you know, it's 10 dimensions. Um, you know, correlations can be quite large. And most importantly, this is an example where I do not use gradient information. So the standard thing uh, in this kind of problems would be either Metropolis Hastings or sequential Monte Carlo. Um, so what we obtained these results. So basically here, uh, there's something red, which is truth and blue, which is our result. And you can see the difference because they're the same. In other words, we have obtained perfect, um, perfect result with, uh, in this case, 10 uh, beta levels uh, and with about 3000 samples, which is several times less than, for example, sequential Monte Carlo uh, needed for on this exactly the same problem. So I think on this kind of problem, this is competitive, uh, maybe even beats the state of the art. Um, and of course, that's our goal that we will be able to get better samples this way. Uh, this took five seconds on a laptop. So this is encouraging, but of course it needs a lot more stress testing on hard distributions. So um, one reason why these, these methods are useful and you know, to, to answer this question, why temperature annealing is because temperature annealing is very powerful for multimodal distributions. Um, and since this uh, SIMF normalizing flow can handle multimodal, can handle any distribution, uh, this certainly works very well. Here I'm showing a ex two dimensional example two Gaussians, these are these black things here. I'm also showing a bunch of samples here that I've drawn. Um, this fits to the Q are, is red. And I'm also showing the density of the samples in blue. All right, uh, basically at low temperature, you know, everything is spread out, but there is uh, some affinity to the where the two peaks are. And then as we go to beta one, we zoom in onto the two peaks and we get, you know, pretty much perfect uh, result in this case. So um, now to answer why, uh, why temperature annealing, you know, if you have score-based um, uh, sampling, so in other words, if you have gradient, you can certainly do other, other possible things. Um, uh, so, and um, so for example, uh, the way to, to think about our, uh, our method is we are really solving both Langevin and Fokker Planck, uh, uh, you know, we are, we are iterating on both Langevin and Fokker Planck, right? So we're using uh, Fokker Planck density, to help us sample, and then we're using the samples to improve the density. Okay, so that's that's one way to think about what we're doing here. Um, and uh, and so if you have gradient, then what can you can do? You can certainly use the gradient information to propagate into the new regions, even if you started some something very far off. Here's one example we ran two dimensions. Uh, the target is this donut here. We started at, at basically at Dirac delta function, and it slowly propagated out. Okay, and, and if about 10 iterations, it, it, it filled the, the whole donut. Okay, and that's because he had the gradient information. This would have been, I think, harder um, if you don't have a gradient, right? If you just have to do metropolis hastening steps. Okay, so uh, how much more time do I have? Oh, okay. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just quickly mention a few other applications. Um, one is global optimization. Um, you can also do global optimization with this kind of normalizing flow methods. Um, now, global optimization, uh, especially if you have multimodal distributions, uh, is a hard problem. And what people try to do is they try to do exploration and exploitation. Right? And, so, and so here, the idea is we're going to use normalizing flow fits to the, to the function uh, for um, exploitation. So because we can then look for the peak of that, uh, of that function. And we're going to use the normalizing flow fits to the density of samples uh, to look for regions where we have low density and we should explore better. Okay, so the, we exploit and explore with two di different density uh, estimations. And you know, this, here's an example of the six hump camelback. It has two peaks. 
uh, the, the, we start from this 10, 10 point sample from the prior and um, uh, well, this was supposed to be a movie, but okay, all right, now I transferred the PDF, so sorry. <laughs> this is actually supposed to be a movie, sorry about that. All you, all you get to see is the first slice, uh, which is unfortunate, but you know, the, the point of this movie would have been to, to zoom in and it zooms in on the two peaks, right? And here I have an ex another example, and again, unfortunately I cannot show you the movie, uh, but the, you know, this is a, you can think of this as a low beta situation. And then as we increase beta, we're zooming in. In fact, we're zooming in on this peak because this peak is higher than two peak than this peak, right? This would be a double Gaussian example. Uh, and you know, in terms of number of calls here, here you know, this is 40 calls. These, these things are competitive with, with the state of the art based in optimization methods um, or genetic algorithms. Okay, and then final application uh, is uh, for Bayesian applications. Sometimes we want Bayesian evidence, normalization constant. And uh, this one is very easy for normalizing flows because they are normalized. So it, it kind of comes out for free, all right? So, uh, but you can play different games um, here. For example, we said, okay, suppose you have samples, uh, you know, somebody else ran samples in our HMC or something like that. Can we just get a normalization? by simply fitting a normalizing flow to it and then do some importance weighting to correct for it, right? And that's exactly what we do. It turns out if you have samples, you can do something called breach sampling, not just important sampling. Breach sampling is where you use information both of, from samples from your target distribution, uh, let's say MCMC samples, and you can also use samples from your approximate distribution, Q, and it turns out that that improves the accuracy. Uh, and so just to give you uh, an example, these are four examples. They vary in dimensionality, I, I believe from, I don't know, 10 to 60 or something like that. You know, the, the bananas, uh, funnels and so on, a multimodality. Uh, oh, this is not showing very well, unfortunately, uh, but uh, the, here is the, the, um, the correct answer on the log Z. Uh, and um, here, for example, the funnel, here are the results from, uh, annealing annealed importance sampling which is you know state of the art and there's a reverse uh, annealed importance sampling here it's supposed to bracket the solution which it does uh, but you know as you can see it's it's useless because it's you know orders of magnitude away um, anyway our method is always bang on so if you ever need an uh, integration constant um, which and of course this you can use also just for doing high dimensional integrals right um, then I think I think these normalizing flows are actually a good way to go uh, to get normalization constant, integration constant. Okay, so let me uh, actually end with, uh, oops, I'm cutting off one line here, but uh, uh, with a discussion, just to maybe hopefully get some, uh, some feedback. Um, so normalizing flows can simplify the geometry, they can precondition uh, and make standard uh, sampling uh, methods more efficient. But normalizing flows also have offer a completely different way of sampling. We're just sampling from the normalizing flow density itself. Okay, uh, I forgot to mention um, when I was going to the slides, but one key uh, advantage of this is we can draw these samples in parallel because they're just draw samples drawn from from this normalizing flow density. So this can be huge, huge uh, um, for, for things that I'm doing, for example, this can be huge, right? Because I can, I can go to a supercomputer and just draw you know, 200 samples in parallel. M maybe each sample is very expensive because I need to run a, a PDE or something like that, but I can do it in parallel. And that can be a huge uh, um, you know, uh, gain there. Now, um, and of course these samples are independent. Uh, and so the acceptance rate depends on how dissimilar the target, uh, this Q is from the target. Uh, and so now which of these two methods are better? I don't have a good answer, um, but I think this approach has a fighting chance um, because it can be afford to be quite inefficient and still win for the simple reason is it doesn't have to deal with thinning of the Markov chains. It doesn't have to deal with uh, leapfrog steps in HMC and stuff like that, right? You know, each sample is really independent, right? So if you are, um, you know, it doesn't help you that uh, you got a uh, hundred chains if they all um, if if they all call it like in my field we have examples where uh, I mean it's almost a, a joke right people have um, hundred leapfrog steps each one is an embody simulation it's a huge cost and the correlation length is six hundred so in other words uh, they have something like I forget you know fifty thousand uh, correlation lengths so in other words every fifty thousand steps 
of a simulation to get one independent sample, right? So you can see how we can be extremely inefficient and still maybe win against these kind of uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo strategies. Okay, so that's um, that's where we are. And so what 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 does this efficiency depend on? Uh, I don't know. Uh, for sure, number of samples, uh, inductive bias of normalizing flows, uh, which may overfit and so that's something where hopefully the, our method is good but we have to explore it further choice of this similarity measure that for sure will play a role uh and then finally of course you know whether you use great information or not uh fisher fisher diversion so on okay so that's it thanks thank you thank you you for a great talk so let's take a few more questions very nice talk uh i have a question uh if i understand correctly so this uh, sampling method, what they are talking about is like, uh, you use normalizing flow to learn the proposal, right? I mean, in MCMC, we just use a very simple proposal, but uh, you use a normalizing flow to learn the proposal. No, not proposal, to learn the, the, the target. Yeah, but uh, at every step, I mean, you cannot learn the target perfectly. You have to learn a proposal and still you have a match of proposal, system. you mean the target? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what you mean proposal. Pro to me, proposal is, is the transition. Uh, yeah, 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 that's what I no, mean. No, I'm not learning that at all, right? I'm learning in, in the kneeling case, I'm just slowly kneeling. Yes. Uh, I start from a prior, yes. right, where, which I know. Yes. And then I'm slowly kneeling and at each uh, temperature, I learn the actual target at that temperature. And then I slowly change the temperature from zero to one. Okay, so yeah, that is what I mean, I mean by proposal. I okay. mean, you have one step proposal. Yeah. So you claim you don't need a gradient information or the score function, but uh, in order to learn this for every step, do you use a stochastic gradient descent over there? Uh, well, um, yeah, so um, uh, there are two ways to do this. Um, you know, first of all, as I said, I discretize the temperature, so I, so I don't actually have that many. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second, then um, we are we are still experimenting. Um, the normal thing I was describing mm -hmm. is not based on stochastic gradient descent; uh, it's iterative. But you, we also have a version where we are uh, running stochastic gradient descent on the target uh, in this on the dissimilarity target, right? On mm -hmm. on the loss function, which is literally the difference between the two probability distribution squared. And then averaged uh, over the samples drawn from 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 the proposal distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one more question is the in terms of the efficiency. So in traditional uh, sampling method, you there is no learning component, right? You just run this algorithm. So in your algorithm, there is a sampling component. There is also a learning component. You need to update the parameter. So when you compare the time and this, do you also take into account of the learning cost? What do you mean by learning? Uh, you want to you oh, see no. in a normalizing flow you need to update your uh, parameters yeah 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 right no the, yeah of course i'm, I'm comparing the, the total time yes uh, okay uh so okay here for example this is the total number of calls it went through 10 steps we have learned 10 different uh density estimations using our method so you know and the total cost was uh five seconds mm -hmm. uh and the number of uh, samples we called uh, was 3000, right? Okay. The normal, this cost right now, yes, here it is dominated by, by normalizing flow because it's about one second or half a second. Uh, but, you know, imagine that, you know, each of these calls was uh, minutes or hours or whatever, then the cost of normalizing flow would be irrelevant, right? Okay, okay. thanks. Yeah, just a, yeah, just a uh, simple question from the beginning. How do you compute, uh, let's say that you, we consider k is equal to one uh, for simplicity, just for simplicity. At the beginning, right, the uh, sliced uh, normalizing flow. So I understand that it's really advantageous to take the direction where they are kind of most different, but how do you find that direction? I mean, that problem is non-convex. and it's, It is non-convex, right? I agree. Um, uh, so um, yeah, I mean, it is an optimization on the direction. Right, so now it's, it's gradient descent on direction, um, and it is non-convex, as you said. But in some sense, we don't care, right? Because so what if we haven't found the best direction? Then we just do it again, no? Okay, thanks. Any other question? Okay. Yeah, hey, uh, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you could comment on sort of like what are some challenges for using this in practice? For instance, like 
uh, while you're running this, did you encounter any like failure cases or like instances in which like the standard MCMC algorithms algorithms are better? Just to get a get yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's too early to say, uh, right? Um, maybe I sh well, <laughs> maybe a different way to answer is if we have tried a lot of things that did not work, right? So there's a lot of failure cases we have kind of crossed, uh, right? And uh, but I'm I'm at least happy that now we maybe have something that seems to work. This came, we have this uh, as of a week ago. Uh, there's no paper, by the way, on this, right? Um, uh, yet, um, and we'll have to see, right? So all of this is still fresh and I don't have any answers to your question, but obviously that's what, where we're going, right? It, this, we want this to succeed and I don't know if it will succeed or not. Right? Thank you. Any other question? Okay. If no more questions, let's thank our speaker, uh, Euros, again. Thank you for a great talk. And uh, we will meet here.